Welcome everyone to Maximizing Business Efficiency and Reducing Waste with Data Integration. Today I am joined by John and Dale, so I'll hand things over to John to introduce himself. Right. Thanks, Elizabeth. So yeah, my name is John Hawkins. Um, I'm the uh, GIS project lead with a, a local government in Ireland. I uh, work for Waterford City and County Council um, and I've been over here for the last 16 years and I've worked in local government with GIS for the last 30 plus years. And my name is Dale Lutz. I'm one of the two co-founders of Safe Software. And uh, I had the pleasure of hearing John speak back in 2012 when I was a much younger person in Dublin, Ireland at an FME world tour stop and i've been so impressed with his work ever since and was thrilled when he made it out to our fme user conference in vancouver in august of this past year and was very enthused about his talk and really wanted it to be shared to a broader audience that wasn't able to be at our uc and so invited john back to speak with us today and so it promises to be very well worth your while Excellent. All right. And at this point, I'll get our presenters to go ahead and turn off their webcams so we can save on bandwidth for the remainder. And with that, if this is your first time in Livestorm, just a few tips and tricks. If you do have any audio issues, you can click that help button on the bottom left for four simple troubleshooting steps. Spoiler, the first one is to simply refresh your browser. If you would like to share your reactions with us during the webinar, we love to see those. Use that React button and there's emojis to select from. And then we have the questions and chat panel. So the questions panel, if you have any questions for John throughout the webinar, please drop those there. And we will have a live Q&A session at the end as well. And the chat panel, you're all using that now. Keep letting us know where you're tuning in from and use that panel to leave any questions or sorry, any comments through the webinar. And I'll pass things back to Dale here. Okay, well, we're going to have a very interesting morning together. And this is not a typical FME webinar. This is more of a focus on the business outcomes and the ways of making organizational change. And so that's why I think this is quite an interesting, different cut at things than, than what if you're used to FME webinars to, to be at. So John's going to walk through his use case and kind of the old ways that people uh, typically would try to introduce change and make improvement using FME, and then walk us through a new way that makes sustained improvements for an organization. And so that's that's the key of the part of our time together. And of course, we'll have some Q&A and chat and so on along the way. And it promises to be very worthwhile. But Elizabeth, you told me, you warned me, we're going to have a poll right away here. That is correct. Prepare yourselves. We're going to have a poll in a moment here. OK. Time for a poll. So I'll launch that now. And you'll see that pop up under that polls tab there. So just let us know if you've ever developed a workspace and used it in your organization only to discover that the information it produces is barely ever used, which is a very sad thing if that's what happens. So uh, go ahead and cast your vote on the right-hand side. I guess you choose yes or no and submit. Is that what you do, Elizabeth? That is correct, yes. And once you submit, do you get to see what's going on? Yes, exactly. Okay. So we'll give everyone a moment here to cast your votes. Wow. It's like uh, over three quarters of the people have produced info that their, their consumers don't use. If that's the case, John, are they in the right place today? They could, they could well be. Yep. Yeah, there's nothing worse than producing something that you think is right and then it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So no, hopefully we'll be able to, to rectify that. Yes. So uh, when, when do we call the plurality, Elizabeth? I think right now we're good. We've got most people have voted. So thanks, everyone. Yes. So yeah, three quarters of you have uh, seen the, the efforts of your labors fall on deaf ears, so to speak. So, uh, so anyway, well, thanks for your honesty there. And, uh, and we'll see if the, the things John teaches today can help nudge that nudge that result uh, in a bit better way. So we'll continue on. I guess I have the power to move slides, don't I, Elizabeth? You do, yes. Wow. 
So go. I'll just spend a few seconds. Uh, if you actually, just out of curiosity, if you want to just put in the chat, if you're new to FME or how long you've used FME, we'd love to know that. So go ahead and just type that into the chat and we'll, uh, we'll kind of get to know each other a bit that way. But if you're not familiar with us, we've been around for I had just had Elizabeth change the thing this morning. It used to say 28 years. Well, we've clicked over and it's been more than 29 years. Arguably, we're in our 30th year now. We'll have our birthday at the end of the year. And, um, and so we've been around for a while, all the time working to make data more usable, to get data from where it needs to be, or from where it is to where it needs to be within organizations. And we've kind of lost track or it's kind of hard to know, but there's at least 16,000 organizations around the world using us in a wide number of countries. We have such an amazing network of partners that delivers FME services all over the place. And I think there's even more than 20,000 active users in the FME community, uh, which is a great place to go to find out more and get answers. I was actually just visiting a customer yesterday in Portland, Oregon, and they commented to me how much they, uh, was it yesterday? No, the two days ago I was in Portland, Oregon. and. Um, they were commenting how important for them the community is to help them get ever more use out of FME. So in terms of what FME actually is, it consists of a few pieces. There's the desktop piece where you build and run workflows that produce information that hopefully more than one quarter of your users actually care about. Um, and so you draw these graphical workflows that can combine data from many different places and transform it, integrate it, rearrange it, and then produce a variety of interesting outputs. You can take that stuff that you've done on the desktop and you might have run it ad hoc when you just needed it, but if you want it to be automated, you can throw that up onto FME server where it runs while you sleep, whenever an email comes in or a file arrives or, some, or a user hits a button on a web form, that's what FME server is all about, making that transformation happen without using your desktop and without you initiating it. FME Cloud is really just hosted FME server. That customer in Portland was thrilled with their their FME Cloud, which allows them to do a wide variety of things outside of their own firewall, but deliver great value to their customers. And lastly, we have a couple of mobile apps, the ability to run these FME rules or automations from, the, from a mobile app anywhere in the field, or to visualize data in immersive augmented reality, which is an emerging field. Perhaps 2023 is the year of augmented reality, but I've been saying that for six or seven years, so we will see. Uh, in terms of the formats we support, we started off, uh, I would almost could say a thousand years ago, but 30 years ago doing GIS and CAD. And of course, that's a key piece of what we do. Uh, but after that, we began adding all kinds of other different types of data. And you can kind of work your way up that, uh, up that graph. And uh, we have artificial intelligence machine learning up on the, on the top right and actually we probably should upgrade update this graph to go to 2022 elizabeth it's uh, it's a year old now um yeah and so uh we actually at the end no it was the beginning of 2023 just what two or three weeks ago elizabeth hosted a webinar talking about using fme to leverage open open ai's um apis and, and being able to do some amazing things there if you haven't seen that i think that that's one worth checking out it's on our safe.com webinars archive uh, but yes, we're always trying to follow wherever data is. Cloud native data formats, also a big thing that we're working on too. Wherever the data is, that's where we want FME to be to support you. And I think with that, I'm going to uh, hand it off to John. Here's a little bit more about him. He's been working for more than 20 years, implementing, managing, and using GIS in both the UK and Ireland. And I guess John got a professional designation uh, with FME just after we first met. So that's yep. been a number of years. Actually, we're in his, Don, John's 10th year as an FME professional. But the key thing that's a big piece of what you're about to see is John's work getting a master's in business administration, his MBA, and that and how FME and the work he was doing integrated together with that. So with that, John, take it away. Dale, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for having me and uh, I hope that you uh, find some of the work that I've done here interesting. As, a, as Dale mentioned, I've been um, now working with FME Professional for um, uh, and um, pretty much so, since I came to Ireland 16 years ago and discovered FME, I've been pretty much using it every day. Um, and just so that people know that at Waterford City and County Council, we have both desktop and then we deploy um, services to 
uh, FEB server where we then run things or via automation or on scheduled tasks to disseminate data or enrich on a, on a daily basis. So pretty much most work that I, I do would be using um, FME desktop. So as Dale mentioned a couple of years ago, I took a step outside of the business and undertook a, a master's in business administration um, just to take a bit of a view outside the public sector. And here I've discovered about you know, not only sort of the, the management and the accounting side of things, but also about uh, change management and really starting to think about how we effectively make change um, to our organizations. And here I also discovered about process improvement and lean and really that journey through uh, my course and then trying to apply that as part of my dissertation is what's brought me here now to really discovering how to improve the, the processes we work on. So uh, as part of this now, really what we're seeing here is starting to ask the question of are the workspaces that we're delivering, that we're spending all our time and, and creating with love and care, are they really delivering what your customers need? Um, and when I refer to customers, I don't just mean for me, working in local government about, you know, often people would think about it's the business community and the public, but as in working within an IT unit within within the council, my customers are often uh, other members of staff working in different sections around the organization. And so if I develop a workspace, it's for them to help them work uh, more efficiently and provide the information they need. But as that poll sort of alluded to, you know, sometimes we, we get an idea or we're given an idea and asked to work on something and we might create this workspace and have that data publishing out to the web for ArcGIS online or internally as part of report, but then only for, for six or seven months later or a year later to discover that no one's actually looking at the data or what we were asked to develop didn't quite meet those needs. So with this, it's, I'm sort of suggesting here that now learning different about different techniques in developing workspaces is to take a step back and, and think about when we're developing some of this work is could they be doing more to make the, the lives of your, your colleagues around the, the organization, their lives easier um, and deliver them more in line of what they actually need. And of course, if you if you start to do that, well, then your organization is going to start delivering better services throughout. So as Dale mentioned before, I'm just going to touch on the, the, the sort of two main areas is the way that I was originally, you know, have been mainly developing workspaces up until a couple of years ago um, and just sort of the typical way that work, uh, projects would come across my desk. And then this new sort of new way of, of doing things and, and thinking about things and sitting down with the people that actually use those are going to make use of that data uh, and really so if you follow some of the steps and techniques that I'm about to show you is that hopefully you'll then see you're developing a workspace that people will use and those improvements um, you will then see to, to your organization. So let's just start with the, the old way. Um, really, uh, a lot of this would be around you know, a, a manager, uh, someone, a team lead within a section. Um, Often it might be the case that they've they've heard me talking about how great FME is and sitting in the canteen and saying, just if you ever come and talk to me about um, what FME can do for you, you know, you, you, you can be able to deliver great things. But through examples of working with other sections and seeing the work that I've done, they might come along and they've got an idea of, of how we how I might be able to assist them. And maybe this person say working in the, in the area of finance they're used to working with financial data which is often uh, columns and rows of financial information and they've got an idea of how they want to try and get some of their information onto a map where they actually want to visualize that information and get a better understanding of it say geographical layout so in local government we have lots of things like commercial rates we're collecting money from different locations and they might want to see where our spread is across the the city and county and also where the rate collectors who go out and about where they're traveling to and just make sure we're keeping our resources in the right area and and this and then also the, the spread of uh money and debt across the across the authority uh, as part of that you'll then need to dig underneath it and they then ask for you to start analyzing that information. As you start trying to put it onto the map, you've got to have a geographic location to be able to, to, to plot it out. And you might start to expose some errors within that information and also, but then also some trends within it as well and some insights. And as part of that, you might then start to cross-reference that information, maybe with national data sets, because 
when we collect rates locally, it's linked to National Valuation Office and they have a figure that they expect us to, to, to gather each year or work to each year. And we want to check against those figures and, and against that data, as Dale was mentioning, that might be sitting out on the cloud and we want to check against that data to see if it's right. Now, we can then produce maybe a spreadsheet that highlights any anomalies. Um, part of this work is to do it that each year we're asked to um, cross-reference all our data and present those figures. But as we know, if the longer we leave things, it's harder than sometimes to unpick or find the errors. So we then start looking at producing spreadsheets maybe at each week to highlight any anomalies in the data. Um, and also then to summarize that spreadsheet. And we know that people say in the finance se section love an old spreadsheet. And then they might look for a, a different a different set of spreadsheets to then analyze information in a certain area, start to look at the debt over certain years as debt collected. Um, if Once debt goes out of year one into year two, it then becomes harder to gather. And once you've gone through and done this analysis, well, then they then said, that's great. Email me that once a week and I can keep on top of my information and I can present that when I go to my team meetings or my senior meetings. But also they want their staff then to keep abreast of this and start to do it. And the next thing is they're asking you to send emails to Bob and Rita and Frank. And then as time goes on, more and more emails are being sent out with these spreadsheets on. And soon that's clutching up people's inboxes and they're not necessarily paying attention to that data. But the, 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 line, the line manager, he's still taking a look at it and following up. And while he may then say, yep, we've been making, I uh, can see some of the problems with our work, with our process. Um, I've managed to rectify some of those issues because I can see the changes in the spreadsheets. He's not necessarily thought about the whole process. He's not necessarily thought about the work of his colleagues and they might now start to ignore those emails because there's just so much coming in and it's interfering with their day work. And so while a small improvement might, be, might have been made, the larger improvement may not have been tackled. So with that, we start to think about true process improvement using FME. And what this is, this isn't about just the line manager coming along and just telling you their interpretation of, of what needs to be done, because often these people are in charge of processes, but they don't necessarily work on them each day. They're not necessarily going out and visiting the individual locations. They're not dealing with the issues that it can be that, that arise. And with process improvement, we have what is called a continuous improvement cycle. Um, this is, comes from a, a, an area called lean. And some of you may have heard about lean and it's related uh, initially to um, connected to uh, car manufacturers. Um, Toyota are one of the famous ones that looked at lean. And what they were looking there is actually, well, how do they improve the process of manufacturing a car? And one of those things was actually to say, OK, let's actually rather than someone walking around um, an actual factory walking to a car and taking the parts and the materials that are needed to construct it let's have the car come to them and that's when you first started seeing cars come on a conveyor belt and people actually standing there and actually as things move along they came to them and you might be interested to know that actually the japanese learned this from the ford motor company first and then took it away and improved it to make it more efficient so the continuous improvement cycle um, has now been picked up by so many other areas as well. It's gone into um, health, it's gone into uh, construction, and now it's way, making its way into local government and public sector work as well, which is ideally, you know, it has so many uh, processes there that people can work on. One of the first steps within this is actually, is when you're sitting down, is that you're sitting down looking at a process, so if you're talking about the car, is actually identifying the value in that. So if it's if it's a car, it's that final finished product coming off the, the off the production line. Value might be someone adding the wheels to the car. But what the value isn't is somebody going off trying to find a nut or nut or a bolt or wasting time going to find um, uh, the particular spanner that they need. So within the, the local government side, this could be an application like someone applying for a housing application. And, and the value there is someone receiving a decision on that. The identifying mapping the stream, the whole point, point of continuous improvement is to identify the whole full cycle and actually to map the stream from beginning to end. So if we're talking about an application now, this is actually it being received in the post into um, the offices, then it's life as it goes through the process 
and goes through the various different stages until the final decision is um, uh, is sent out by post. And the important thing here is that you actually understand it from the beginning to end. And the reason for that is that you then don't go and make any changes or decide to do anything until you've understand that full understood that full stream. The other way there, other thing to identify then is you want to create flow by eliminating waste. So as I mentioned earlier, if you had someone going looking for something, if it was, you know, if you're talking about a housing application, someone has to go and look for a particular file. They have to get up from the desk. They have to go into a particular uh, um, uh cupboard to go and pull out the relevant files or open up a computer system to type into the database and it's not there and they've got to go somewhere else that flow can be inhibited by the looking for the different elements so what you're looking to do is trying to improve that flow by removing what they call what they call waste so in the example earlier i said about lots of emails coming into people's inboxes well if you've got to go searching through those inboxes that's that's waste occurring there and the other part then is to respond to customer pull. So if your member of your section actually wants to do a piece of work, at that point, they want to gather and grab that information. So, you know, if someone needing that spanner, they turn around and the spanner's there and they can then get on with their work. Or if they're looking to make a decision, they want to press a button and immediately there's the report with the information in it. They need to make that decision rather than, again, going off and searching it. So a lot of you may now have heard the sort of just-in-time um, processes that, that occur. And then you pursue affection. The idea here that you then eliminate that waste, you improve that flow and improve the process. And once you've done it, you then look to start again. And so that you, by each time, you remove the fat from the process, making it leaner and leaner each time. And that's where this value part comes from, the, and it's within lean process principles and methods. But just so you know how this is going to relate to um, FME, let me show you what it actually looks like, and then hopefully it'll make more sense to you. So, as I said, I was looking at change management and lean as part of my, uh, my part of my course. And so, as uh, as once I'd learned these elements, I said, okay, well, let's see the next project that comes along. Let's see if we can do things a different way, and what actual benefits we can derive by looking to work in this process. And sure enough, it wasn't too long before. Uh, the team lead for our development management section within the planning department came along. They're responsible for planning applications coming in, people looking to wish to build a new house, an extension, or maybe a developer looking to build 100 houses, or it could be a factory or anything such as that. The team lead identified that the, the process currently lacked a standardized assessment format. The document that was produced, the final report, was coming in different formats. So making it very difficult for them to make a final decision because information was scattered across different parts of the report. They were also aware that people were wasting time on producing the documentation. They were having to reformat existing Word documents or go off looking into many different places to find the information required. And the section itself was under pressure to not only keep up with the numbers of planning applications that were coming in, but also to deal with other uh, important issues that the planning section has to deal with, such as um, unauthorized developments. But that was the, that's all. That was the second job on the list once they got the planning applications out of the way. So what I said to them was, "That's okay. That's great. We'll take a look at that. Uh, but to do that, I want us to actually sit down and follow the principles of Lean and actually map out the whole process. If you want to, and then we can actually gauge what the problem is fully, and then look to tackle that. So." They, 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 they agree to that process and working with staff, and this is the key fact that the key point, you're working with the staff that work on the process. You're not working with people that think this is how the process is working. You're actually working with the people that actually work on that process. And with them, we invent, I sat down uh, in the meetings and we identified the value. We mapped that entire process from beginning to end. And then together, we identified areas to be improved upon. And then we carried out um, a time and motion study on the areas identified to reveal the hidden workings and waste within those. So that's really sitting down and gaining that sort of greater understanding. And of course, once all that was done, then we looked to develop the FME workspace, not before, develop the FME workspace to remove that waste. And the key thing here is that having gone through that initial effort, you'll then look at, you then really are sitting down developing an FME workspace, knowing and picturing what it is the person really needs to use. Uh, and you're really putting those transformers in and picturing how that's going to help resolve their problem. So 
did that work? And let's see if we can find out. So here is the development management team. Key point here is it's just in that room are the people that work on the process. The senior managements, who if they're not involved in the process, they're not in the room because as we all know, we might tell each other how we, we, we do our work each day, but if the boss is in the room, we might describe it how they want to hear it. So the important thing is there's no point um, kidding ourselves. We want to know exactly how something happens. So it's sitting down with the various different members of staff. They might not be involved in it from beginning to end. They might only be involved in it in particular points along, along the way. And really, it's a very really interesting task to do that. As you can see there, behind them is what is the process map as it starts off as a blank piece of white paper. And onto that, we put post-it notes. The yellow post-it notes are the points of the different points along the process. On the left-hand side was our planning application coming into the section, and on the far right was the final decision. And along the way, working, sitting down with the team and discussing it from the beginning to the end, we then noted the different decisions that would have to happen along the way. And it's key here to also say, particularly in local government, as I'm sure with many other organizations, that it's not often that people get a chance to step back and appreciate what it is they do. And often when you're sitting in this sort of environment, it really helps each other actually understand what it is the work that they do and how it interacts with each other. And also suddenly those wastes can start to be uh, exposed. You know, didn't know that this was happening or didn't know that this was taking that long. So on that board behind, you see some pink post-it notes that start to identify some potential uh, changes to the system. And of course, not all of those are IT related. They could be just practical things about how things are dealt with, where things are put on a desk, how something is receipted into the section. But some of them, of course, are then IT. And the idea here is that you identify those different opportunities and look to improve the process to produce one better way. And the green stickers uh, are then and identifying the amount of time something could take from the minimum to the medium to the extreme. And once that exercise has been has taken place, there's then it's actually mapped out so that you get this nice process value process uh, diagram here where you have at the beginning the planning application being received and stamped and validated and it going through the different steps and as we can see here we like the look of this because it starts to already give us a bit of a feel about an fme workspace and this is all the different steps and decisions that the planning uh, planning application travels through when you submit it to a, 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 an authority and sure enough as we went through we identified down here that it was a planner's report and there was varying different times being taken for that report to um, be produced and people were starting to produce it in different ways. And sure enough, there was lots of potential there for FME to help that process. So that was definitely something we would start to look into. But because we took the time and we understood the whole process, we suddenly revealed before, before that step, there was a site visit occurring where planners were going out to site, going around the, uh, the county, and as anybody that's visited Ireland would know, there's not many road numbers on roads around Ireland. Um, and there's a lot of small uh, Shabin roads up here and there, and it can be difficult to navigate. So we discovered that as new um, planners were coming in, sometimes they would have difficulty and there was varying different ways of actually trying to locate planning applications when out and about. So we can saw an opportunity there to use FME and an ArcGIS and integrated SatNav systems with Google and Apple Maps to actually help navigate people around. And one of the key things that we also identified as well is that whole one looking at the whole process with Lean and understanding it. It's then also important that everybody gets a clear view of what's going on in that process and what's passing through that process. And this is all around monitoring. So here again, we could see how FME could maybe gather up and regularly update a possible ArcGIS dashboard to help everyone, not just management, but all the staff involved in the process so that, that they know what's on, what's going on and what's in play. And then it's nice and obvious for everyone involved. So what did we do? Well, the next thing is after stepping, um, identifying that the planner's report needed some attention and having the main key items, we then undertook what is called, well, it's traditionally called a time of motion study. Here, I'd, we actually refer to this as a, a step study, because really what you're trying to do is dig into a particular step and just understand it. And of course, this does have connotations with someone standing there with a, a clipboard and a, and a timer. And really, that is what it is. You know, you want to sit down, but you want to get an understanding. But when actually working with staff, what you want to do is that actual sitting down with someone. And when it's one to one, 
And this was then, I then started to work with three planners and observed what was indeed was three individual ways of working. And indeed, then they were producing three different templates and three different sets of wording. But the sitting down with the planner was the most interesting part as well, that actually I was stopping and starting the timer to get a greater understanding, but also starting to hear about why they did things a certain way. And obviously, people train throughout the years and are immensely proud of the work that they do. And by watching someone actually use an IT system and using mouse clicks, it then reveals so many different hidden ways of working that potentially you could help improve someone's uh, working life. So what did we discover from our step, our step analysis? Well, when looking at it, we discovered that only 39% of the time when producing the, the planner's report was actually spent value adding. And what I really, from the planner's point of view at this point, was taking all the information and making the decision whether to permit a particular planning application. And if they were to permit it, I looking through the different information to see the impact on the local area and then considering what conditions should be applied to that planning application. But while observing the work that they did and taking the statistics from this, we then identified some the non-value added elements. So something as simple as 50 seconds spent working around a problem that could easily be fixed. And in this instance, it was observing that when they were looking to produce their report, they were clicking on a link that unfortunately was no longer working and wasn't opening the planning application system at the particular planning application uh, that they wanted. And so I said, well, why did you not tell anyone that the link's broken? And they said, oh, well, don't worry about it. It only takes me a few seconds, and I just go here, and I search the number, and then up it comes. And I said, well, just tell IT, and we can get it fixed. And it's like, well, sure. Oh, geez, when will that ever get done? But by witnessing it there, I went back to the office and got it fixed. And so immediately the next day, it was, it was resolved. And that was suddenly 50 seconds for each application suddenly got back. And, you know, that means that that 5% now is 5% more time spent on value added. So let's have a look at some other the other things that then were revealed. We also then saw an underutilization of resources. So witnessing um, planners taking information, copying and pasting information from the planning system, which had been entered in by the planning admin, admin staff as the planning application had been submitted and dragging their mouse across and copying and pasting it into a Word document. So this information had already been edited, already added in. They even observed one, plan one planner typing all the information back in from scratch because, and this is the interesting thing when you sit down with people, someone had said to him in the past, it's your name that will be on that final report and you want to make sure it says exactly what it, um, what it says for the site notice. So, but saying with them, well, that information is already in there. We can get that information across. So for, we observed four to six minutes spent copying and pasting and reformatting that text. So I'd say unnecessary work. And then other necessary things. When you're when you're working with watching someone maybe only work grappling with one monitor rather than two, the amount of times they have to open and close windows, go into different systems and applications and copy and paste that information across. I observed 35 times that they did this, was where potentially all that information could be there in one go. And 95 plus mouse clicks that didn't need to be done. And again, it's that time that was being uh, wasted. So now let's start to think about the before and the after. Let's have a look at the before, the reading and the formatting of data. And it's point, important to note at this stage as well, while my, a lot of my experience is around the geographical information side, the, the, the spatial element, a lot of the, this work as well is, and more and more the work that I do now is non-spatial data as well. And it's just work you know even for, you know, creating these word documents and getting that information there's so much potential there uh, from an fme specific perspective as well so the formatting of the textual data how this was looking before is that some of the planners were opening up a completely blank uh, word document report with some just some headers in it other ones were opening up previous reports and then deleting things out of it and starting again from afresh they were then going into the planning system looking at the information in there and maybe copying information from the development description and the different numbers and information, copying and pasting across into that Word document. And as we all know, copying and pasting, you know, there can be problems. You can paste the wrong piece of information or forget to copy, or run, copy across the wrong piece of information. Also, they'd have to go in and look at the consultations, find out the different information, and again, note and type in these. And eventually, they get all the other information in, and then they can start to type in uh, their decision around based on that side of the data. So having observed that side, 
what I could then readily see and do is I could develop a WinFME workspace that to make that change is, well, let's remove that unnecessary copying and pasting. So here I've just got a, a short automation showing um, the different steps within the uh, workspace whereby I've got feature readers grabbing information from the planning application system. It's getting the description information they were copying and pasting and using um, these uh, transformers that were originally um, from the community forum, um, now using the embedded Microsoft transformers. It then takes that information and puts it into the right parts of the report. And the important part is that we've then created a, uh, a format, a style of report working with those planners. Um, this is the important thing to say that when we then agreed how it would look, they designed the, 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 the template, we agreed the wording, and now we can see here how the information, FME has produced this whole Word document from scratch, including the logo. The information highlighted in yellow has been gathered from the iPlan system and pasted in, um, inserted into the document. The headers, the fonts, all of that element has all been generated by FME. And what that means is that you've then got that consistent style and look of information. And also with a bit of care and effort as well is that you can actually start to put in that sort of plain English style as well. That is obviously the most um, important part when it comes to this as well. On the spatial analyst side, what we saw was here how traditionally the planner was opening up. Um, it was an ArcGIS web map with 60 plus layers of constraint data. They were going along and clicking, searching and finding the planning application number, clicking on that location to view the site boundary, and then starting to query all the different layers of information below and to start to note that information again into the, uh, the, the report. A lot of this information may be coming from national data sets as well as local data sets. And with all of that, there was again, huge potential to actually say, okay, well, while a of course a planner still would need to go and check the map and get a good idea of the surroundings of what they're deciding on. Well, within FME now, we have these great feature readers. Well, actually we can pass in that site boundary into a feature reader. And if you're not using uh, feature readers, I do encourage you to do so because they're so much quicker. You just pass in that spatial boundary. It queries the end data set and returns just the information that's needed. So as you can see, this, the UX case is indeed quite complex, but it's querying multiple layers of information, passing in a defined site boundary and returning all the instances. If What for certain ones we can then do is here, we can then put it into uh, plain English. We're gathering the, the key information from the layer that's been identified, and we can then pass that forward into to, to Word formatting. But also, as Dale mentioned earlier, we're now connecting also to national data sets. So rather than holding local copies, this workspace is also going to national information about the Parks and Wildlife Service on um, conservation areas and areas of um, natural beauty. And again, here we can see that spatial information now gathered and populated into the map. And you can see here, I note whether it comes from a national data set such as archaeology.ie or from the local system, which we call what maps. And it puts the information in there. The whole idea now is with this is that the report is populated with all the data. The planner can then look at it and then considering the type of application they're dealing with is then delete what isn't required, but also obviously still look at the map. And again, providing them with information so that they can jump straight to that good lo that location on the map. So what we have managed to do by sitting down with the staff and working with them to identify the potential problems within their process and importantly, devising with them how that might look in the future. And that's an important thing when doing process mapping is you, you're starting to look at, this is the process now, okay, how might that process look in the future? And so I'm pleased to say that we managed to make and implement um, a, 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 an improvement with the planner's report. Now we have that workspace deployed to FME server. The planners can call up a, a simple form. They can fill in the planning application number of the one they're working on, pick their name. They can also pick the type of planning application. So if it's for a single dwelling or if it's for an agricultural barn, different pieces of information will be gathered and put into that information. And what we can then say um, 
is that once they've run that, that information is then emailed to them. And the way that looks is um, like this, is that an application, the email is received with links back, to, with direct links back to the various information. Now I know earlier I mentioned that I didn't like uh, too many emails flying around and indeed we're currently working on how we're gonna write this now to Office 365 to SharePoint online directly and just have that give them a notification in Teams. But the main key thing here is that this application is delivered to them on demand. When they're ready to do that report, it's on demand right now, gather the information. And from a planner's point of view, that's important as well because things might change in the planning system. Consultation might be occurring and now they're looking for that information to, to, be, um, to, to be as up-to-date as possible or any constraints. And then the, well, it's now extended to about a 14-page report. Here we can see it. It's there. All the information is in, and now they can get down to the business of being a planner and applying their knowledge and writing their final decisions. And just so simply after eight clicks of the mouse and a wait of 20 seconds, that report is ready for them to work on. But when doing all this work is we don't just then say, right, great, I think that's all working well, is you then go back and you reanalyze it. You want to see, have you indeed reduced the, the waste that you're, your, uh, you expected to, and is it working in the right way that the planners want? And uh, I'm pleased to say that when we went back, as you might remember, we said value added activities beforehand were 39%. So I set, sat down with the planners and we did a, a step study again and took again timings. And we did do timings across different applications. But after that, we did come up with an average of where they were now spending 86% of their time on value added activities, giving them so much more time back to actually doing the work of a planner and, and working on and making the decisions that they need. So thanks to 300 plus transformers, um, planners now spend 40% more of their time and dealing with value added activities. And that value added activity might not just be the planner's report. It might then mean as now has happened is that they now can go on and deal with those unauthorized development complaints. And that's always a very important thing is that you're looking to give people back time to do the work. People are always busy, but you're looking to give them the time to do the work that they need to do. You're not looking to make savings in terms of staff, and that's very important to stress to people. So they are now experiencing time savings of around 41% during that stage of the overall process. And But we didn't stop there. We, the, we did move on, and then from the other elements, we then did pick up, and we were good to our word, and we said, okay, now what we'll do is we'll produce an overview dashboard that is now available to all members of staff involved in planning from the chief executive uh, members of the planning admin team and so that everybody involved in that process now has full oversight and allocation and again that gives people responsibility they can see their names who's allocated what the planner in charge of allocating planning applications can also see uh, what planning applications need to be allocated that la large red bar actually um, planning applications are now entering the system and using some clever date transformers we can actually um, monitor the different stages of a planning application which statutory has an eight-week process so we can make sure we're meeting those times and deadlines but we also then went on and we started to look at the site visit app as well here it was then very easy to say okay those planning applications are receipted they've come in they're being allocated to a planner well, let's just get that information written out to ArcGIS online and let's just get and then let's get them so they can access it on their smartphone. And here you can see how Brendan can pull up the planning application, click on Google Map directions and go straight there. And that stops him writing down lat longs onto the outside of his case folders. Also, because we've integrated this and we have links now to all the online documentation, he no longer has to take his case files with him. And for anybody new joining the authority, and this is very important, by doing all this work, it enables people, their onboarding process and getting to terms with the way a new authority works, allows them to get up to speed so much easier because there is a defined process for them to work on. And indeed, we've now continued to work back with the section and have made additional improvements since, uh, since as well, because we don't just want to assume that the work that we did um, has been delivered fully. So. I encourage you to really improve a process to really make those workspaces um, that 
you produce and spend a lot of love and time is to take your passion for FME and visit where the work is is actually undertaken, where the value is really added. Uh, in Japanese, this is the gemba, the, the coal face, if you like, because I guarantee you, you'll develop a knowledge there, what, like a tacit knowledge that when you sit down with FME and you'll just be able to picture and you'll actually have to restrain yourself from the so many different things you can do to focus for them and really you will see that you will develop workspaces that will be right first time um, you'll discover so many different opportunities ones that you won't wouldn't be have previously been aware of how fme can be deployed within your organization to help improve the process and make indeed the lives of your colleagues easier and in turn you know from a local government perspective deliver uh, better public services which is what what we're all about Within Ireland, the local government has over 1,000 public services uh, from planning, builder control, environment, cemeteries, libraries. And we've, I'm using our FME in many different areas, but that is just so, there is just so much potential there that we can do, uh, and particularly you know, how we can share that work as well. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. I'll stop there and uh, hand back to... Uh... Yes, well, thanks so much, John. I think... Uh... Elizabeth is back as well. I just have to get a little editorial comment in there on that slide about the site visit app. It's sort of folklore here in North America that in general, the directions are very tricky in, in Ireland. Um, and uh, you're getting, getting told how to go from one place to another is a little bit tricky. So it, I'd have to think if the folklore is true that that site visit app saves a great deal of time. It, yep. It, 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 it certainly does. I mean, as I say, I mean, for, for, for myself, someone coming to Ireland um, and just, you know, where you've got places, you know, someone will say, oh, you know, go on the Tremor Road. Well, you don't you don't know quite, you know where Tremor is, but you don't you don't know. Which, there's so many roads going to Tremor, which road they're actually referring to. So it's, yes. you know, it's just make, particularly say someone coming from a different part of Ireland um, moving here or particularly from the UK. It just makes their life so much easier. There's a, a wonderful sketch. I think it's a, a comedy sketch about getting some directions in Ireland that uh, that I've shown before at the beginning of talks I've given. And one of my friends who's Irish tells the story of having to look behind him so he knows where he's going because there was something about the, <laughs> the signs. And uh, and anyway, you can you can weave that into a whole life life story. But anyway, thanks so much, John. And um, we'll have a bit of time for some more Q and A in a second. We just wanted to. Uh, wrap up by saying, hey, if you want to follow up on anything you saw today and talk with us, feel free to drop us a line at info at safe.com. You can also grab our latest release on the um, on, on our on our website there where there's a free trial. I don't think we're actually going to have any webinar workspaces here, but you can look at the recording afterwards to get a sense of what John is up to. I just love seeing the Microsoft Word. We've kind of had like 2023 is the seems to be the year of Microsoft Word related webinars. We've got another one coming up in a few weeks as well, and we've done some more before. But it's just interesting how useful it can be to automate the production of documents uh, yeah. and, and remove, because otherwise that stuff, as you said, John, is being copied and pasted. And yeah. it's got to be not only drudgery, but error prone. It, definitely. I mean, like even just, you know, just having that sort of standard work template to get that report delivered. I mean, the new embedded um, word uh transformers which we now we have a new version of the workspace that's currently being developed yeah um it may that you know there's a little bit of learning in it and i'm sure they'll get slightly better as well but you know you can create that template and of course because you're producing it it can't be broken you know it's being delivered yes. the other thing as well is now with particularly COVID has forced an awful lot of us to move to office 365 yeah and now we want to try and leverage the ability of actually writing this information to SharePoint online as well. We're discovering a few technical issues just in terms of getting that set up, but we yep. have it tested in theory and it works. And once we get the connections to stick, is it's, you know, because one of the key on, on, on particular documents, you know, or proposals, if that person's suddenly not in the office and that document is sitting on that person's laptop, well, it's all over. You know, the whole thing maybe has to start again. But if we get it written to SharePoint online and that document is shared and available to everyone, well, then all the better. And of course, if it's then written in a standard uh, plain English as well, then, you know, we're, you know, you're really then moving forward. Yes. You know, uh, I think maybe, Elizabeth, I can ask you to chat out the the link. We did a webinar with actually another person from Ireland. It was, um, I think, let's see, Philip 
Jacob. Yes, he was from the kind of evaluations office, and he also showed how amazing um, ROI they got out of producing Word documents, actually just uh, removing a lot of effort. And so, and actually, we've yeah. got Mary Brown from Switzerland coming up as well really? in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Is it next week, Elizabeth? It is next week. Yeah. And I just chatted out that link as well, right before the webinar you were just mentioning, which is also in the chat now. Yeah. The, the one coming up, I know I was uh, involved a little bit in some of the demos we're going to do. That's going to be more of a tutorial. So Mary's going to talk about what they're up to, but then there's going to be a tutorial, how you actually can start to do this bit by bit. But yeah, really important to be aware of this type of uh, type of approach. So yes, if you're part of the FME community, you can uh, claim the badge WACGM and gather up another uh, another trinket in your uh, collection of badges that uh, many of you have so many, it's it's very impressive to, to see. We almost should give real awards uh, eventually for people that accumulate enough of those. Um, we have other webinars. I've just been dropping a few. Check it out at safe.com slash webinars and our archive is there of past ones as well on a wide variety of topics too. And we have this FME accelerator, which if you're not, if you're new to FME and you want to kind of get going, if you can give 90 minutes, you get a machine and you get fired up and it walks you, I guess, soup to nuts, beginning to end, uh, desktop to server, getting some value out of FME in just 90 minutes. There's also an ebook, if ebook about spatial data for the enterprise. If anybody is interested in that, you can grab that from our website. Oh yes, and this was the one. This was the slide, Elizabeth. I said I was going to talk to, and I went and talked to all of them. Sorry about that. But Not good. maybe Elizabeth, you can talk to this one. I'll put you on the spot. Sure. So, super early bird registration for the peak of data integration coming to Bonn, Germany in 2023. I'll chat out that link there. Um, and I do believe Dale, we're already the majority sold out of super early bird uh, tickets there. So definitely get that ideal pricing while you can. It's the cheapest yes, I just was in touch with uh, our organizer this morning and she said there still are some left, but uh, the way we're doing it this year, it's kind of like, I guess, like Southwest Airlines, the first seats that are sold are less expensive than the last ones. So you are rewarded for coming in early. So, exactly. and it's going to be a really, we're, we're thinking we could have as many as a thousand people there. Certainly the FME you see in Vancouver, even though COVID was barely over, we, we had more than 500 here in Vancouver and geographically, there's a lot more FME users close to Bonn, Germany than there are to Vancouver, BC. So we're pretty excited about that. John, are you going to be there? Uh, I hope so, though. <laughs> uh, the business yes. case is in, so I'd certainly hope to get over there. And um, well, for anybody, I mean, having visited uh, the one in Vancouver, it just was such a uh, a great experience um, for someone that really enjoys working with FME and use it every day. It's just you know great to get that different perspective of how things are actually being, how FME is being used and the different ways it's being applied and just really being part of that conference was just, you know, came away with so many inspirations and I've been connecting up with different people from, from the U S to Canada, New Zealand's from it. And I would really hope that by getting to Bonn, I can then start connecting with more people around Europe as well. Yes. Yeah. It is a, an amazing networking opportunity of like-minded people. And if I can be so bold, Frankly, the the most wonderful people in the world seem to be in the FME user community. Something about FME seems to be a filter that attracts absolutely wonderful people, and um, and it, it's you know that's one of the highlights of my career. Frankly, is getting to meet uh, all all the users I can. And if there's any regret I have, is that I just can't meet everybody at these kind of events. But uh, but certainly, please do uh, come join us in Germany if you can. So, on to the Q and A side of things. Yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. We can probably go ahead and turn back on our webcams here at this point and take a look. We did have Carmel has a, a question in the questions panel. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, okay, Elizabeth has put it up. So, so John, um, I don't actually know what e-planning and i-planning are. So is that apps that are in your part of the world? Yeah, so the uh, i-planning one is um, a system used by the majority of local authorities where we actually, uh, that's what we use to process our planning applications through. 
Um, but the e-planning initiative is now how we're now starting to receive planning applications into our authorities in digital form. So traditionally, that whole men- that that system, the process I was mentioning to you earlier is has been traditionally uh, a paper application and paper drawings being delivered to the office that then need to be scanned and entered in. We now have e-planning whereby. Um, if my understanding is right, that we have, you know, certain architects and agencies will actually submit the application to us. So they will actually type that information into the system, which then will appear into our internal iPlan system. And then that will be used uh, onto the next stage within um, the planning application process and the report that the work that I saw. So some of us have been implementing it. Um, Come on, direct answer. Yes, we have implemented it. I thought that then this would maybe be a big change to what we might need to do in terms of that process. Would I need to go back and revisit it? Well, it actually it's coming quite seamlessly because the information is finding its way into iPlan. Uh, we have some technical challenges just around about how the planning application boundary is captured because that's the important bit for all those spatial constraint information and getting it out to the public. But uh, the um, what we've what we've really just seen is it's just changed the validation end of the uh, of the workflow. There is indeed some uh, possibilities around where FME can be used to make the validation step easier uh, and more smoother for um, colleagues. But we'll be working on that in the future. Excellent, excellent. And you know, one thing that I was wondering just around the change management, when you introduce things like this, and I love that slide where you had gathered together the the actual people who are affected by change. How do you get people to buy into these kinds of things before you've delivered the results? Uh, well, I suppose, I mean, part of it is, you know, you, you've got to try and sort of just create that engagement. And there was, I mean, that the first one was obviously there was a, le- a, le- a level of trust to say to, you know, to say to the senior management, A, would you allow people to come out off, take a day away? So, is a great way of bribing people, um, promising them a bit of lunch during the day, rewarding them for the work that they do. Um, But also saying that trying to bring along a couple of people that work on each step, because then you're not just focusing on one person to get answer, to answer that question for many. It's important. So it's if you ideally, if you have more than one person, then you when you watch the dynamics in the room, you see them referring to each other and come up with a decision. You know, they can discuss around what it is actually they do and come up with that, that the way of describing it. But the other way is where they're saying that this would all be done in the open. Everyone would be aware of it. That that chart that was up on that meeting room wall, that was left there for a couple of days, didn't do anything for a couple of days. So in case they went home or came back in the next morning, a while thinking about, you know what, I said that wrong because there was a lot to work through and that trust that they go in there and the post-it notes and then it allows other people that they can come in, discuss it with them. You then take it away, produce your process map, the as is process map as, it, as, as it's titled. You send that around, you get the comments and then you design and agree where you're going to go and tackle. So it's that it's the, it's the engagement piece. And also mm-hmm. uh, once, and, and then the key thing as well is you'll just na- naturally find it that people want you know, they want to do a good job. They want to have the right tools to do it. They want things to be, you know, they've got opinions and often sometimes those opinions aren't listened to, but you find if you can listen to those opinions and help take it from each person, that it shapes the final output of the workspace and the work that's done. Well, then you get that engagement to actually use it going on. And really very much that when that draft report was delivered and put down, you could see them saying, Oh, I can see that that was my, that was my suggestion. You know, each of them had, right. Uh, ownership on it and you know one of the key things has been now that they've now many of those planners have moved on and new planners have come in but they can now i've got a basis to work on so they're now actually a lot of the planners that have moved to other organizations are now spreading the word Mm -hmm. Uh, i think well, it just it sounds like, you know, for you going into those meetings with a like a compassionate and curious attitude a stance of i'm here to listen yeah Oh, very much. Yeah. And it's not, yeah, it's not to have, um, it, yeah, you, you're not, and this is one of the key things is, and it's very difficult for developers, um, is, is to have an assumption of how something works. Right. And particularly when you're detached from that process, you've got an assumption of how it works. And the, and the, it's like that manager originally, uh, they have an assumption of how, how that works. And so by going in with an open mind and actually listening and, and, and watching it and doing the step study, well, then that's what then, gives you that you develop this sort of tacit knowledge and really understand it. Yes. Fantastic. 
Well, let's see, we, we might have time for just one more question and we'll call this a wrap. Uh, someone asked, have you shared this with other local councils? So uh, yes, we have um, within Ireland. We've sh we've we've shared the work that the, the, we've shared the work that we've done. We have a national GIS user group, um, IMGS, that are your your partner mm. here in Ireland. Yep. They also host groups. Um, the workspace wouldn't necessarily be direct plug and play, but certainly we within Ireland, the IT departments. You know, we have a, a build and share model. So you yep. know, it, we we normally we don't have any trouble doing that. I mean, this one is quite complicated, so it wouldn't necessarily be a plug and play, but, you know, certainly happy to do so. And we've presented on that regularly. Um, I might actually just touch on another question there that I see someone mentioned there that this might sound crazy, but after the automation, was there a feeling from these employers whose work had been automated that they might lose their jobs? Well, no, there wasn't because the pressure, the whole point was they were saying we've got more planning applications coming in. We can't keep up with the work that's being done. We need to get onto these other things around um, um, unauthorized development complaints, and really, that's and then it's it's if you want to develop what they say is like a change culture and a culture that looks to develop lean, it's very much about not doing that. The, the 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 really what they found is they had the time given back to them to do their work better to consider the decision, um, and really. Once we got into there, they, 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 that 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 fear was quickly allayed, um, and really we've been able to use this model now to go to other sections to show that the work that can the work that can occur, you know, and particularly within public sector, you know, you know, you, you don't, you know, people get moved around from section to section, but you know, it's um, you, you don't often see people lose. You, we don't get bonuses, unfortunately, um, so. You know, but this is a great way of engaging with that star with staff to actually, you know, to, to, to get that process working smoother. Yeah, we've had feedback from one uh, customer in a local council that, that introduced some FME work that saved all kinds of time. And they brought this to the mayor and, the, and asked for some additional funding. And the mayor's only comment was, why didn't we do this a year ago? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and that's the other great thing. I mean, if you do this work and put the effort into the actual the the, if you put the effort into doing the check the first time about how long something takes, and then take the effort mm -hmm. to check about how long it takes after, well, then you can quantify it. You know, um, chief executives, managers, they all understand numbers, and you can take that you know take that time spent or wasted, and quickly show you know how efficient a section is, or or, or use to start to argue for new resources or additional resources. Yeah. There was one other question about what happens when the process changes midstream. Uh, does that uh, does that ever happen, or or I guess what are some tips you'd have for for that type of situation? Well, the, the main thing is if well if the the, the process changes midstream. So I assume here that you're saying that the, the, you've desired, you you're looking at something working in a particular way, and then something suddenly comes along to impacts on it. Well, you just you take you take that step back. You put the process map go down, and then you you map it out and say, okay, what's the change? The big important thing, and I most really didn't stress this enough, is you need to make sure that you understand what the beginning and the end is, and you don't make a change until you understand those two end the beginning and end point because you can make any change along that process that would impact uh, uh, elsewhere. So mm. as much as you might put a lot of effort into doing something, I think sometimes while you think you've developed the best workspace that's delivering the right result, sometimes you need to face up and say, okay, this has changed. Let's take that, let's tear that apart. If this isn't working right, let's do it again. So mm. we must be on the fourth iteration now of that FME workspace and a big bunch of work mm. something had to occur last year because we had a new development plan come into play. So those mm. 60 plus constraint layers they all changed. They went up to 80. Some came in, some came out. And while it was a headache, what it meant is that we managed to, in a day, switch from decisions being made on one development plan to the other one. Now, it was oh. a bit of effort, but it just, you know, it was so seamless. There was none of this people picking up maps, trying to, you know, to, to, to zoom in with their eyes almost to try and see, yeah. well, what's the difference? It immediately, we presented the change, which was great. Wow. Resilience to change. I think uh, we should probably call it a wrap there. So if anybody wants to follow up with John, I, he's provided his email address and I'm sure he'd be, um, he's passionate about this. And so if you want to follow up, please do. But I just want to thank you so much, John, for sharing this story, both at our UC, but also to this broader audience today. And I'm really hopeful that I mean, at the end of the day, I wake up in the morning because I hope that the work that we do at SAFE improves the working lives of the customers we touch and the outcomes that they can have for their, for their 
customers effectively. And this yeah. was a fantastic example of that. So thank you so much, John. I can tell from the reaction that this really resonated with our audience today. And we are grateful for you spending your time with us. Dale, thank you so much indeed. It's been a pleasure. Yes. All right, Elizabeth, uh, what do we do to wrap it up? I think I'll just wrap it up by saying thanks so much, Dale and John, and our whole audience for tuning in today. And if you do have a moment to fill out our webinar survey, we really appreciate any feedback. Thanks, everyone, and hope you have a great rest of your days. All right. Thank you. All right. All the best. All right.